I think we're live. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll just wait a minute or so for everyone to join. I hope everyone is uh, keeping safe and uh, doing well wherever you are, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, it's really great to have you here today. Um, welcome to What Do Workers' Rights Have to Do with Human Rights? Um, this is a part of our monthly webinar series that we've been doing. It usually takes place on uh, the last Thursday of each month. And we're really excited to have you join us today. And we're always grateful for your participation. Um, my name is Caldwell Manners. I'm the communications coordinator here at CPT. And I'm calling in from the Kasi Hills in Northeast India. Uh, today, we're, I'm really excited to uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar where we'll be having Runak from uh, Suleimania Iraqi Kurdistan, join us, Dalla from Hebron, Palestine, and Alejo from Barranca Bermeja, Colombia will be joining us, all of them working on our teams um, in their respective places. And they'll be sharing stories to draw us to this question of what do workers' rights have to do with human rights? Um, before we kind of keep going, uh, I just want to give you a little update on things that have been happening. There's just been so much happening in the news these days. Um, and Colombia and Kurdistan and Palestine has just been a lot on the news. So just to give you a little update on what's happening in, in Colombia, today marks the a month since the protests uh, began uh, in Colombia. And there's been a very unified public outcry against inequity that's there in the country. Um, students and unions and workers and farmers, indigenous peoples, um, every human rights defenders, everyone has come out, uh, out into the streets against uh, the inequality in the country and against the excessive police brutality recently that we've seen. Even today, the Inter-American Courts, um, Inter-American Committee on Human Rights actually declared that protests have generally been um, peaceful, but a lot of the folks are coming out uh, due to the provocations by a lot of the police brutality that's been happening. In Palestine, since the ceasefire, uh, there has been increased settler activity in Hebron. Uh, um, the team says that a lot of uh, the settlers who have been active in a lot of the attacks on Palestinians around uh, Israel, around Jerusalem, um, have been people from Hebron and they've kind of come back to the city. And so there's just been an uptick uh, of, of harassment to local Hebronites. Um, as well in the neighborhood of Silwan, close to Sheikh Jarrah, um, the court has postponed the decision to forcefully displace about 84 families. Uh, over in the last um, three days, uh, the Turkish uh, government army has been bombing the borders along Turkey and Iraqi Kurdistan and uh, displacing families. They recently also bombed a water source for nine families, uh, nine villages. And as they are uh, bombing, they have been also been taking up land and re and building roads to connect back into uh, Turkey um, and, uh, in a sense, invading a lot of this territory. So, with that in the context, what does uh, what do workers' rights have to do with uh, human rights? Um, there's just so much of an intersection over there. 
earlier earlier this month, uh, CPT announced that it would be uh, working on uh, a new policy. Not working on. They, they started a new policy of paying a living wage to all CPTers. Um, we you can check out our website at cpt.org for the statement that we put out. Um, and it's a part of our own growth as an organization in the work of challenging uh, and undoing systems of oppression. It's become imperative for us to even look inward to rectify and grow within ourselves. For the last 35 years, we've been working alongside activists, union workers, farmers, laborers, both from the organized and or unorganized sectors who've been fighting for their own human rights so that they can have a dignified life and not a dignified life only in terms of monetary compensation uh, that equates to labor, but because their lives, uh, they, dignity means having a life of sustainability and, and of health as well. Yesterday on Instagram, uh, Hannah, our uh, social media uh, associate uh, interviewed uh, our co-directors Milena and Muriel about what this change meant. And if you have the time, check that out uh, and you can see a little bit more of what, what, they, what they explained there. Um, and so as we've been evaluating uh, our own process, um, it's, it's become even more important for us to make this move towards a living wage. And so today uh, the teams will be sharing with you stories of what do workers' rights have to do with human rights. And um, I'm gonna just turn over the space to Runak who, from Suleimania, who will be beginning and sharing the story from IEK. Runak. Thank you, Colwell. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Runak Brada. I'm working with CPT IK team. Today, I'm happy to speak with you about workers' rights and resistance in Iraqi Kurdistan. I'm also happy to learn from the other teams in this webinar. Thank you all for being here today. Since um, 2006, CPT has worked in Iraqi Kurdistan to document violence and oppression. A critical part of our work is of supporting workers, especially government workers. In Iraqi Kurdistan, 35% of region's employees are working for government. So many people in Iraqi Kurdistan are depend on government jobs for their income. Unfortunately, um, uh, government workers um, experience much oppression from Kurdistan regional government as they have received salary cuts every year from government um, since 2014. So um, for seven years, workers have not been paid fairly by the government. Um, the KRG started cutting salaries um, in 2014 for two reasons. The first reason was because the KRG claimed they could not afford to pay um, salaries because of the financial cost of fighting against ISIS. And the second reason was the Iraqi government no longer provided funds to KRG since KRG was selling billion, um, billions of dollars <coughs> worth of oil. So um, after their salaries were cut, um, government employees faced um, many difficulties with providing for their basic needs as their salaries were their only source of income. So um, many families have lost their income, they have been paid unfairly, while the government still makes much profit um, as the government's profit from 2014 to 2019 was more than 35 billions of dollars solely from oil exports. Um, but only 29% of these oils revenues uh, went into the government's budget, while the remaining are still unknown. Even the private sector in Iraqi Kurdistan faces government corruption, um, as the largest companies in Iraqi Kurdistan mostly are owned by high ranking government officials, so its revenues goes to those in power again. 
Um, so this um, government corruption motivated people to take to the streets and start protests in 2015. A number of um, um, a number of those employees who uh, participated in protests went on a strike, hoping to pressure KRG to pay their salaries. Most of the protests were organized by teachers, healthcare workers, with the help of activists. CPT has been able to support protesters from the beginning, um, documenting their resistance and sharing their voices with the international community. One of the protesters who CPT has accompanied is Badal Barwari, who is one of our partners now. Badal Barwari has worked as a teacher for 27 years and as an organizer and activist for 15 years. Badal has dedicated himself to the struggle for workers' rights. He started organizing um, protests in 2015, demanding the KRG to pay their salaries. In response to KRG delaying payments um, to government employees, Badal once said the KRG is giving my salary as charity rather than as a right. Over the past years, Badal um, has been arrested multiple of times for his activism and organizing for workers' rights. Uh, on August 21st last year, Badal was arrested again with a number of protesters for organizing an, a demonstration demanding their salaries. Badal, um, unfortunately, is still in prison now, waiting for the court's ruling. As uh, Badal Badwari has um, been incarcerated for almost a year, CPT has partnered with him and his family to fight for his freedom. Uh, a critical part of our accompaniment with Badal Barwari is our defense campaign, which seeks to put a pressure on KRG to release Badal Barwari and other prisoners who are fighting for workers' rights. Um, since we launched our campaign, um, we have been in contact with Badal's family regularly. We have organized demonstration. We collected petition um, asking the KRG to release Badal Barwari. We published statements and we organized a press conference with a number of activists. And uh, finally, we share Badal's story with the world. The harm and uh, oppression workers like Badal Barwari experience in Iraqi Kurdistan is a tragedy. We as um, CPT Iraqi Kurdistan hope for a day when Badal Barwari and um, many other workers are released from prison. Until that day, we will continue to advocate for their rights and freedom. Thank you so much, Runak, for that presentation. Um, such a difficult situation there with so many of the activists and journalists who have been arrested uh, and for Badal's family as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we want to go next to uh, Abdullah, who will be sharing with us from Hebron in Palestine. And before I, Abdullah shares, I just want to make a note that if you do have questions, you'll see in the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box where you could type in your questions. Uh, at the end of uh, presentations, we'll take your questions, try to get, get through them. Abdullah. Thank you, Kazwal. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Abdullah, I'm working with CBT Palestine team in Al Khalil Hebron. Uh, today I will be walk, uh, talking about uh, a very important topic in Palestine, which is the Palestinian employees. And I will focus today about the Palestinian employees who go uh, and work inside 1948 territories or what's known as Israel. I will talk about the reasons why they are heading toward the Israeli side in order to work. Uh, and we will talk about the vaccination process that happens that was targeting only the Palestinians who's crossing the borders in order to work on the other side. And then we will talk about the legal permissions 
that they need to get from the Israeli side in order for them to work in Israel. First of all, one of the main reasons for Palestinian workers and employees to go to the Israeli side to work is the high unemployment rate in Palestine, which is, according to the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, it's around 25.9% among the populations, which is occur mainly between the youth and their ages between 15 and 24 years old. So by because of this high unemployment rate, most of the youth and people who wanted to start their lives, they decided to go and work inside the Israeli side in different fields, mainly construction workers, restaurants, or uh, hotels in general. So, uh, the other reason uh, why they are working, because the minimum average wage in Palestine is really high. It's around 1,450 shekels which is equal around $445. While in Israel, when they work there, they get a minimum wage around 6,000 shekels, which is over $1,000 in general. We're talking about almost $67 per day working in Israel in comparison to almost $22 per day in working in the West Bank. Even though that there's a good amount of money sometimes for them when they work there, but this uh, salary is full of risk because if you are a Palestinian and you want to go to Israel to work, you need to apply for something called a military permission, which means that you need to find a contractor inside, an Israeli contractor mainly, to recruit you, to hire you. According to that, you will apply to a special military permission through the Israeli military. In order to get this military permission, you need to have a clear record or a criminal record, as they call it. Now, most of the Palestinians, you don't need to be in, let's say, a criminal to have a clean record. But if someone within your family committed something in the past, you will be included with the family who have the same last name as you, and you will be added to the blacklist which has led some Palestinians to the other way, which is going illegally in order for them to work there, which means that they have to risk their lives in order to cross the borders to work on the other side. Uh, crossing the borders mean going in the early, early morning. Sometimes they need to jump walls to find someone or some groups of people who's known as a smugglers. They have to, to find a special connection with with some special Israeli police officers on the other side to smuggle people to the other side. And if they get arrested, they face normally charges between six months to 12 months in prison, and they will be blacklisted from getting any military permission or even traveling. Now, the other problem that those workers face is crossing through the military checkpoints in order for them to reach the Israeli side. They need to go at 3 a.m. in the morning to wait in line for three to four hours in order to cross. I will share with you a couple of pictures showing how normally they cross. So this is one of the main checkpoints that connect the Palestinian territories with the other side. And you see those workers carrying heavy bags with them because as long as they cross to the other side, they spend their weeks, sometimes months, they don't go, go back to their families until they finish the job they have it, whether it was in construction buildings or in another sector. Another picture is like this. They have to wait in the long, long lines. Sometimes when they enter the military checkpoint, they will be turned back by the Israeli military for any kind of reasons. And this is how a military checkpoint in the early morning looks like almost every day for those workers in order for them to cross to the other side. Now, a lot of Palestinians who have a military permission, they avoid going through this checkpoint sometimes because they don't want to face this humiliation experience. So a lot of them, they hold the permission, but they decided to risk their lives by going and taking the illegal way arranging with some people to smuggle them to the other side in order for them 
to avoid this kind of, of a humiliation. And you see the, the lines that leads to the checkpoint inside, it's form as a cage and people spend hours and hours there until they get the chance to cross to the other side. Sometimes after this huge and long trip, people will cross to the other side and they will find the bus for the company they work for. It's already gone because they can't wait for everyone. This is one of the ways for people to go there illegally. There are some specific spots that doesn't have a full barrier. So they found some spots from there. They cut sometimes some metal fences and they cross through it to the other side. Here is another picture around 3 a.m. This is from uh, Bethlehem checkpoint, which is known as 300 checkpoint. Now, another thing I would like to talk about is the vaccination process that started by the Israeli government on March 1st, 2020. When the is uh, 2021, sorry, when the Israeli government decided to vaccinate around 100,000 Palestinians who works in Israel and holding uh, a work permit in Israel. But the only way that Israelis decided to vaccinate those Palestinian workers, because they have direct interaction with the Israelis there, and Israel was already starting a vaccination process. But the other Palestinians living in the West Bank, they were not, they didn't get the chance to get vaccinated. Only Palestinians who work inside Israel and carry a military permission and the work permits, they get vaccinated by the Israelis. Uh, there was around eight vaccination centers along the, not the borders, the barriers that divide the Palestinian territories from the Israeli side. Approximately 1,000 Palestinian workers were vaccinated each day until they reached this number, which is estimated around 1,000, 100,000 Palestinians who get vaccinated. Uh, one another problem uh, Palestinian workers face it, and this is recently started to appear, sorry, uh, during the current uh, actions that took place in Jerusalem and inside 1948 areas. Palestinian workers were attacked uh, by some Israeli mobs inside some Palestinian cities there. Uh, they were attacked by Israeli military, even though that they have a special working permission working there. One of the other main problems also they face it because they sleep in the working place. They sleep in not in a good conditions. If they work in construction buildings, they, they sleep and they stay over in the same construction site without any safety measures whatsoever. No medical insurance at all and no days paid day or days off or retirement plan whatsoever. Uh, this is all for me, giving back the mic for you, Caldwell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdullah. Thank you for uh, sharing the, the amount of racism that goes into creating, in terms of the vaccine policy, just protecting, you know, the people who are working within those Israeli territories to get vaccinated. Um, thank you, thank you for sharing that very, very sad story. Uh, next, um, we have Alejo sharing for us from uh, Barranca Bermeja. Alejo. Thanks, uh, Well, I'm going to talk and describe a little bit of what's going on here in Colombia what's going on with the national strike and how is the situation of the workers and their conditions in my country and in Barranca Bermeja. First, I want to, to say how we understand the workers' right. And for us, the right to work is fundamental and essential to, to achieve uh, other human rights and workers' rights constitute an uh, inseparable part of the human dignity. 
all the people have the right to work, to live, and live with dignity. This is how we understand this, this right. Uh, so as Paul was said before, here in Colombia and in Barranca Bermeja, we are in a general strike since one month ago. And this is a scenario that I want to describe a little bit more. Uh, Colombia is a society that has suffered violence from the case. Um, in 2016, we, we live a peace agreement between the oldest guerrilla in Colombia and the government. And this situation uh, create a feeling of hope in many sectors of the society that is spread and make us think that we can build a new country and a new society, a better society with more rights and with more access to work, to education, to social care. But since 2018, the new government and the right wings to ascend to the power here in Colombia, all this uh, idea of a better country and a better society go down. Uh, in April, we started the general strike. Is was a the general strike was a an opportunity for those who have been excluded and who have been ignored to express why they want and what they are demanding. This general strike is not only gather unions or different unions, also this strike gather students, gather farmers, uh, gather women, gather all these uh, population that doesn't have or don't get to essential rights in Colombia. This is a, a scenario where we are seeing how our country have been ruled for a specific uh, people who don't care of who are not uh, in the position to guarantee the rights of those who, who haven't. So I'm gonna say some statics from the National Department of Statistics in Colombia. And more than 3 million of young women and men are unemployed here in Colombia. And the general rate of unemployment in Colombia is around 14% of the population. In Colombia, we have a population, we are 50 million, around 50 million people. So it's a huge number of people that doesn't have unemployed and or people that are not in this rate, but they are work in a precarious labor condition. So uh, we can see and we see every day in our reality that this number of people that are not employee and the government and this number that the government registered is not accurate. There are more people that are suffering uh, bad or oh, bad conditions of uh, labor conditions, but they are not rated by the by the by the statistics. Uh, here in Colombia, despite the system of the the rule of law, a democratic system, and a human rights institutions. Uh, we are facing a structural challenge that is overcoming issues relating with the form of discriminations and inequity that have increased over time, which are, which are particularly affecting groups as people of Afro-descendant, women, indigenous people, campesinos, and rural workers, also street people that on the streets, and people living uh, in informal uh, urban uh, settlements or peripheral areas. This structural inequity is intrinsically linked to social exclusion and to access to land, to social care, to social care, and to education. 
uh, why this general strike is special in the Colombian history. Uh, we think that this uh, moment is important and we hope that this moment uh, let us get a better, a better country because it's the first time in Colombia when different demands from different sectors uh, gather or go uh, for uh, common goals. Uh, this is not just a, a strike where the unions or where the students uh, are, in, are trying to get uh, their demands and, and trying that the government guarantee their rights. Right now we are seeing those people who never were interested in politics and were never interested in the how the, the, the state have been ruling. And now all this mix of uh, I'm hopeless, uh, or oh, hopelessness, sorry, uh, is gathered in a, in a, in the same moment, yeah, in, 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 in this opportunity. Uh, but we are seeing that the government and the state and the police, their response has been with, or have been so brutal and violent. Uh, the state has chose to design and implement security policies that are based on violence and punitive institutional action on the part of the, or on the part of the military size police forces. And this resulting is seriously human rights violations. This high also there, there are a high, or there is a high degree of impunity surrounding cases of institutional violence for the most part of the cases and the justice system has made up no progress investigations, convictions or reparations for victims of the police brutality during this general strike. I want to, to tell you uh, some numbers or statistics about how violence has been this repression uh, by the police. Uh, around 44 assassinations from the police have been done. This assassination is under investigations, uh, but different NGO had claimed that 44 people have been murdered by the police in their actions trying to, to dissolve the, the demonstrations and the, and the and try to contain the, the demands of the protesters. Around 955 people have been victims of physical violence, 1,388 uh, people have been arbitrarily detained. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, around 100, 300, 1,388 uh, people have so, had suffered arbitrary detentions. Uh, 46 people have been wounded on their eyes, in their eyes, and there have been 165 cases of shooting of people wounded by police shooting. Also, there have been five cases of gender-based violence and 22 uh, cases of sexual violence. Why we think, why we, ECAP or CPT Colombia are accompanying this general strike? We in the Barranca Bermeja city uh, during these 20, 20 years working here, we have accompanied different social process, including unions demanding. Uh, 
Uh, right now, we are accompanying two states of, uh, of social uh, work uh, and unions, uh, Sinantra y Sinantra Inal. It's a union here in Barranca Bermeja to represent the workers of food industry. And two weeks ago, one of his members, one of his members was killed in other city, Medellin. Sinantra Inal is a union to represent workers in different cities here in Colombia. But also Colombia, if you are a uh, if you work in a, in, a, in a union or if you represent uh, workers here in Colombia, it's so dangerous. It's from 19, say, 1971 until 2018, 3,642 people who work in unions have been killed in Colombia. It's represent, it's some, it's, it's a, a number that let, let us understand how dangerous it is to work for better conditions or labor, or labor conditions here in Colombia. Uh, and we think that accompany and support these demands and this struggle is a way to build uh, to be part of the better country and for putting in uh, to different kind of violence and oppressions here in, in our society. Uh, see. Okay, what, what we hope of this moment, of this strike, we hope that at least those people who have not opportunity to get to fundamental rights like social care, education, work, uh, a better life. I hope that this moment led us to get this, to this or led us to achieve these important goals to, to obtain or to become a better, a better society with more equity. And I, I want to, to show and to present uh, some pictures that we have uh, that show you what's how the 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 protesters express their their hope for a better country. And I want to to say that this strike in the media we. That there is like a, a, a an intention to to show the, the demonstrators and to the protesters as a violent people, but we uh, here in Barranca Bermeja have witnessing the the the, the, most, the cultural and artistic and artistic uh, expressions during all this month of of strike. So I will I will show you uh, a moment. These photos is a it's an example of how the population is marching and how this strike gather different uh, sector of the of the society here in Colombia. This is this is the students. Women also, and this message is and this message is so strong. Is you never will not uh, will not have any more 
de que our, de, our silence, eh, yeah, you will never, you will, eh, sorry, you will never have the, com the commodity of our silence. Is the, is the meaning of this, this card. So this is all for me. I have finished. Thank you so much, Alejo. Thank you so much for sharing about what, what's happening right now. Uh, definitely, it's great to see those pictures of Barranca Bermeja, not only because I remember the city as well, but because there is such a, a power in the unity of, of people coming together in such large groups. Um, just to our, our uh, attendees, I would just like to say, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, note them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we can uh, ask the panelists. Um, and panelists, if you also have questions for, for others, uh, please feel free to ask uh, your questions as well. Um, Rona, could I start off with you? Could I ask you a question about some of your, uh, about what you shared? Uh, at this moment, there are many journalists and activists who've been arrested in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, so why is this happening? And how does Badal Barwari connect to these addresses? Thank you, um, Caldwell. Um, so the KRG is uh, arresting the workers and journalists who are criticizing the government's corruption and failure to pay workers. One of the reasons that KRG is arresting them is to stop them from organizing protests. So basically these arrests are one of the government's tool to um, make workers to afri afraid of organizing any protests. And um, unfortunately, it seems that it has been, um, uh, like this policy, it has, been, um, uh, it has been effective in stopping people to organize protests in some regions uh, in Iraq. Thank you. Abdullah, um, you know, I was, when you were sharing, I was curious about the workers that you were talking about who have to cross uh, the barrier every day, 3 a.m. looking at those images. Um, are, I'm curious, are workers able to organize, like the, particularly the kind of workers that you're talking about, are they able to organize and unionize? What is making a union or creating a union look like in under the occupation? Unfortunately, they can since they are Palestinians and they can't be part of the Israeli workers unions as well, since they are holding a Palestinian idea and they live in the West Bank. Is there what is what is what is a way for them to uh, demand for some kinds of rights? Is there what's what's their avenue? There are some organizations and some this is the Palestinians holding an Israeli citizenship. So sometimes and most of the times. Uh, uh, they take cases for Palestinian workers who've been working there for companies or for construction buildings for many, many years. And there is many successful cases actually for some workers who get not a retirement salary, but who get their uh, awards or uh, a specific amount of money according to their uh, working years or days inside the Israeli area or inside the other side. Um, 
Alejo, I've I've been uh, Latin America has such a long history. Colombia has such a long history of of uh, general strikes and uh, and large large protests. What do you feel uh, this time around? Why why is this time's general strike different? Do you can you speak to that? So I think this time is different because it's not it's not only a struggle of teachers or unions or a, unemployment people. I think that this time all these demands gathered in one general strike. It's the first time that I think this situation is ha uh, happening. And, and I think that now after the peace agreement and the idea of, uh, of peace that we, that we had, I think that the people realize that if, if we don't ask for a better country right now, maybe we, we have lost an important and a historical chance. Of course, the government is trying to repress this idea and all this like a, a general a hope. But I think that in the first time in many years in Colombia, uh, and a non-violence way to change how we live, I think that this is a unique opportunity, at least in the last six or five decades. So this definitely must be a very big moment of hope for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. Those who have been excluded and ignored, now they feel hope in this moment. And, and they think that right now, all they think that they, their voice right now will be here or by those who made the police, made the policies and take the decisions. I know I had another question about Colombia in terms of um, a lot of our partners, you know, they are farmers and um, they're mostly what they produce generally is not counted in the formal economy as part of the GDP they produce and they sell uh, in the markets close by. Um, what does equity, what does uh, labor rights, what does farming rights, um, what would it mean for them? What do you think it would mean for them uh, with the demands that are being placed right now during this general strike? What would it mean for farmers who are you know, far away from uh, a lot of the urban centers? Uh, how would these kind of uh, rights affect them or benefit them? I feel that this, this moment uh, for, for farmers, uh, but also for people who live in the uh, rural areas here in Colombia, this ha it has been the opportunity to, to raise their voice. Uh, for example, right now in Barranca Bermeja, 700 farmers is arriving, is coming to, to, to protest, to just because they feel that if they gather their struggle with the other struggles and the, if the rural demands and the urban demands uh, go together and show to the government that this situation has to end, I feel that the, the, the idea of, of get a better, a better condition for them on their, on their rural areas uh, will be possible to, to, to create a new 
a new yeah a new Colombian rural area uh, here in Colombia with all the conflict the the most affected people were the peasants and the farmers so also there is like a their farmers and the people from the rural areas are raising their voice because they actually are suffering the, the consequences of the idea of the consequences of the government who have not implementing the, the peace accord. It's also like it's also the opportunity for them to, to demand the implementation of the laws of the law that the peace agreement uh, create for them. For example, uh, we have a structural problem of access to the land. And uh, I know that, and I feel that this moment, the people and the peasants are trying to, to, press, to, to put pressure on the government to guarantee this right, the right to access to land. So I think that for them is an important moment because it's not just the, camp, the, the peasants' demands plus the others' demands that I have described before. Thank, thank you, Alejo. Um, Runak, uh, so the team has been accompanying teachers for a while now. Um, how can how can others from outside IK support the team and support the struggle of the teachers at this moment? Yeah, thank you for your interest to supporting uh, teachers in Iraqi um, Kurdistan. Uh, at this moment, Badal will be in court uh, in July. So um, one of the ways that um, people can support him and the other teachers in Iraqi Kurdistan is by, all, uh, by following our work and our campaign. We are very concerned about what will happen with the court's decision, but hopefully there should be um, a lot of action that will be happening at that time. So um, we will keep, um, keep you updated about the situation of teachers and workers at that time. Thank you. Um, Abdullah, um, just as a closing question, um, how does, what role do you see the team in, in Palestine playing in supporting more of uh, labor issues? Uh, and how has the team been supporting labor issues in uh, currently? Uh, mainly, uh, uh, also one of the issues that we see or Normally when we do our school run at the checkpoints, at the same checkpoints when students crossing from the checkpoints to go to their schools, there is also Palestinian workers who's working on the local market, who's working also on the local market, they cross from the same checkpoints, which is located in the old city of Hebron. Now, uh, what I suggest also for the future for Palestine team in CBT is if we are, if we can organize something at those checks where Palestinians have to cross to the other side in order to reach their working place. Uh, just to make them feel their story will be shared, for instance, because uh, the, this kind of conditions for Palestinian workers inside Israel it's not familiar by a lot of people in general. Uh, there is not a lot of spotlight on it. And I think the whole world should know about this kind of humiliation and using the Palestinian workers as a way to be indirectly part of the occupation. Because those Palestinian workers have very bad work conditions 
Second, uh, the only way that let them go and work inside Israel, it's the bad economical situation, which is, and let's not forget that the economic uh, environment in Palestine in general, it's completely controlled by the Israelis. So the bad economic situation that we are facing, it's a result of occupation in general, which has resulted in high employ unemployment rate, not a lot of job opportunities, which has led those Palestinian workers crossing to the other side in order to work. So I think also what we can do, or suggestions in the future, what we can do as a Palestinian team for CBT is to focus more on the Palestinian workers, issues, which is an international issue in general, the, the, the workers in general, it's an international issue, whether uh, uh, in what kind of uh, problems they face in their payment, retirement plan, and so on. So those, I think we can find the similarities and what unite all workers from all over the world in such a huge case like this. Thank you, Abdullah. You make a very important point uh, that the work, workers' rights is a huge and important uh, conversation and the important issue that each one of us needs to be involved in. Um, what we can see in our economic system is that it breaks workers into atoms and, uh, you know, takes away every opportunity to, to organize ourselves. So we need to unite uh, workers in Palestine, workers in IK, workers in Colombia, workers here in India and workers where you uh, participants are at. Um, I think uh, it just makes so much more sense for us to work together and in solidarity. Uh, part of our work as well in CPT, um, as you've been hearing these stories are so much dependent on us in our move in CPT towards a living wage. Um, and for us to kind of like walk into that and um, so much of it depends on your solidarity and your support for us. So um, thank you for participating. Thank you for joining. Thank you for um, listening to our stories. Uh, there will be links all over this chat where you can find uh, more information about the work of each teams. And also we've got a link for where you could consider supporting us um, in the work that we do um, in our own um, walk and belief in a living wage. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, standing with us and thank you for supporting us. Um, check us out at cptaction.org, cpt.org uh, uh, as well, and follow us on social media. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for your time. <laughs>